Well, in the next less than an hour, we uh, will finish up the Gospel of John. In view of the fact that we've gotten through 16 chapters, that's not entirely uh, daunting. Uh, but, of course, if we really were to treat John the way he, uh, the Gospel deserves to be treated in detail, we would never get there. Now, chapter 17 <coughs> is at the end of the, uh, of the upper room discourse of Christ. He then, with his disciples, left the upper room where they'd had the Last Supper, and they went out into uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, where, is, where he ultimately was arrested. But uh, it would appear, it's not entirely clear, but it appeared that they were en route to the Garden of Gethsemane, or maybe they hadn't left the room yet, but when Jesus prayed this prayer that dominates chapter 17. All of chapter 17 is the prayer. Sometimes people call it Christ's high priestly prayer because he's praying intercessory prayer for his disciples. You could call it that. The Bible doesn't use that term for it, but it's sometimes referred to that way yeah, by Christians. <clears throat> the main thing about the prayer is that Jesus is at the end of his ministry. He's uh, checking in with headquarters, saying, hey, I've done the job. I've got it done. These men you gave me, I have uh, I've given them what you asked me to give them. Uh, and then he begins to pray for them that, that the, you know, the devil won't get the best of them in his absence. It says in chapter 17, when Jesus had spoken these words, meaning those of the upper room discourse, and the reason I said that this might be on the way to Gethsemane is because, interestingly, at the end of uh, chapter 14, several chapters earlier, the last verse in chapter 14, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, Rise, let us go from here. But then he kept talking for two more chapters. So uh, <clears throat> at the end of chapter 14, he's nowhere near the end of the discourse. But he says, Arise, let's go from here. So they left the table, but maybe, they, maybe he was saying all these other things while they were cleaning up the dishes or something. I don't know what they were doing. Or you know, putting, their, putting their coats on and their shoes on or whatever. But uh, uh, at some point, they left the room. And they were en route to the Garden of Gethsemane. So uh, he may have uttered some of the latter parts of this discourse while they were not in the room uh, or, or not. But I, I'm assuming, I've always pictured that he is doing this. Oh, I need to fix this. Thanks, uh, honey. I roused my wife from her lethargy and she came to tell me that the camera was set wrong. <laughs> there she goes again, back to her lethargy. See you at lunchtime. Uh, <laughs> And so I've always pictured this as he's, and the disciples are kind of walking uh, to the garden, and he's praying now. He's finished talking to them, now he talks to God about them. Uh, Jesus, when he had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. <clears throat> Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Eternal life is not a reward for a certain number of religious actions that you do. Eternal life is knowing God. Knowing God is eternal life. It's being connected in a relationship, a vital relationship with God of a proper sort, that confers eternal life because only God possesses it. Remember I was saying last night, Paul said in 1 Timothy 6.16, only God possesses immortality. And only those who are in Christ are given the gift of immortality. We only have eternal life in Christ. We skipped over it because of the shortage of time, but in chapter 15 there was that talk about the vine and the branches. Jesus, I'm the true vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, you'll bear fruit. He said, anyone who doesn't abide in me is cast forth as a branch and withered, and they gather them and burn them. That's the first six verses of John 15. Now, He's saying that there's eternal life in him. And if we are in him like branches in a, the organism of a, a vine, well, the life that is in the vine is in the branches, as long as they're attached. If they become disattached, if they depart from him, well, then there's no more life in them. They had eternal life, but they don't have it anymore. See, some people get confused by this statement, eternal life. Whoever believes in him has eternal life. That means you can never lose it, right? No. Eternal life is not in you, it's in Christ. 
That's what it says in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. It says, he's given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. It's not in me, it's in him. It's as I am in him and remain in him that his life remains in me. But like a branch that is attached to a vine, it has only the life that's in the vine in it. As long as it's attached, you cut off that branch, there's no more life in it. The vine still has eternal life, and the branches who are attached to the vine are experiencing eternal life because that's the only kind that is there. But when, the, when a branch becomes disattached, it no longer is enjoying eternal life. It's still there in the vine, but they're not participating. So the life I have in Christ is eternal, but it's only as I abide in him, as I remain in him. It's in him that the life is found. And so he's saying this is eternal life, that they may know you and the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. In other words, knowing him is, is what it means to abide in him. If you know God, not know about God, and there's a world of difference between knowing the Bible and knowing God. The Pharisees knew the Bible. They didn't know or love God. There's a world of difference between knowing about God and knowing God as a person. I know a lot about Donald Trump because he's been in the news a lot the last few years, but I don't know him. People sometimes ask me my opinion about him, and I think, I don't know the guy, you know? Do you think he's a Christian? I don't know him. I, sometimes he says things that makes me think he might not be. Sometimes I've heard rumors that he might have become a Christian. I don't know. I'd have to know the man in order to answer questions like that. I know lots of things about him because he's in the news all the time. I got a lot of information, but not personal relationship information. So I can't answer for somebody that I don't know. And same thing with God. You can know all about God. You can be a theological professor in a seminary and not know God, never having had any personal experience with him. And so, I mean, like the Mormons, we were mentioning the Mormons a, a, a moment ago during the break. Uh, they emphasize this personal knowledge, this personal testimony, they call it, this burning in the bosom that they have. Now, unfortunately, in my opinion, most of them are testifying to something that's perhaps a counterfeit uh, testimony. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just, that's my assessment. But to their credit, they emphasize the need to know inwardly, to know personally, to have a real connection, a real experience with God. And that is something people need, whether they'll find it in the Mormon Church or the Jehovah's Witnesses or any other group uh, is another question to debate. But Christians, real Christians, need to have that too. It says in, in Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. If you're born again and a child of God, there should be a witness it says in 1 John chapter 5, he that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. So, I mean, there is such a thing as having this testimony. Uh, we don't usually call it a burning in the bosom. That's more of a, uh, specifically a Mormon expression. But, but they, are, they are testifying to something. And I believe in many cases what they know is not really God. I don't think it's really the Holy Spirit. But, but the main thing I'm saying is whether they have the real thing or not, there is a real thing, and real Christians are supposed to have it. And that's the main thing I'm trying to get across. Knowing God, that is eternal life. It's not doing a number of religious things and earning eternal life. It's being connected in a relationship with God. And a relationship doesn't mean he's my pal. It means I'm submitted to him. He's my Lord. He's my king. I'm his servant. I'm his friend. And I love him. And that's, uh, that's knowing God. And that is eternal life. And I would suggest this too, that since knowing God can be shallow or deep, just like knowing any other person that you're acquainted with, knowing someone a little bit or knowing them extensively, uh, so also with God. You can know God well or know him a little bit. And if eternal life is knowing God, then the more you know him really, the more rich and full and, and uh, dynamic that life is, I believe. And so, there in verse 3, it's very important. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have accomplished the work that you gave me to do. 
so Jesus did finish what he was supposed to do. There is more to be done. He actually said earlier in chapter 16 to his disciples, I have many other things to say to you. You're not ready for them, so I can't say them now. The Holy Spirit's going to have to do that when he comes. So there were things still needed to be done, but they couldn't be done during his earthly time here. That was, some of that work was going to be picked up by the Holy Spirit, obviously, and continued. But he did what he could do. He did what he was expected to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people. Now, the word name is not referring to the name Yahweh or Jehovah or anything like that. The word name in, in the Bible refers to a person's identity, who they are, their character. More, it's sort of like we might say, my good name. You know, my, my good name was compromised by that gossip. What's my good name? My reputation, who I am, my character, how people know me and understand me or think of me. The, the word name in English usually just means those words on my birth certificate that people call me by, the handle, how people address me to get my attention, Steve. That's my name. But in Bible, the word name has much more involved than that. It, re it stands for the whole person. He says, I've, I've, uh, I've manifested your name, it means I've manifested you. I, my disciples now know who you are, what you're like. I've demonstrated to them who you are. I've told them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so that was his mission, among other things, to die and rise again, too. And he says, about those that you've, uh, he says, that you gave me out of the world, yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they kept your word. I mentioned the other day, he's pointing out that the ones that he earlier referred to in chapter 6 as those that the Father gives me were people who were already God's people. He says, they were yours, and you gave them to me. They were, the, they were the faithful remnant in Israel before they discovered Christ. But God made sure that his faithful remnant did discover Christ, and he gave them to Christ. Okay, Christ, you lead. Jesus, you lead. You take over. You be the shepherd of these people. They were mine, now they're yours. In other words, to be one of God's people, now you've got to be one of Jesus' people, because all those that are God's have been given to Jesus. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and I have come to know, and they have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have glor I'm glorified in them. Now he says, I'm not praying for the world. Some people say, Oh, then Jesus doesn't care about the world. He only prays for his disciples. Uh, why doesn't he pray for the world? Well, he just means in this prayer, I'm not praying for the world. These things I'm asking right now are not applicable to the world. They're applicable to my disciples. He did pray for the world. When he was on the cross, remember, he interceded. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Jesus does pray for the world. John, Paul said uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I, I want prayers and supplications to be made for all men for kings and all who are in authority and so forth. He goes on. You know, we're supposed to pray for every, every kind of people, not just Christians. And Jesus prays for others than Christians. But this is an intercessory prayer that is specifically for the Christians. There are other prayers, but this, not this one. It's not for the world. What's he praying for them? He's praying that they'll be sanctified. He's praying that they'll be united. He's praying that they'll be kept from evil. These are the things that he's actually praying for them. He's not praying that for the world. It says, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. So he prays for the unity and for them to be kept. He says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, meaning Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak to in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now, many Christians feel like the hope of the Christians is to be taken out of the world. I need to get out of this world. Jesus wants to take us and rapture us, take us out of the world and go off and live in heaven. Uh, he said, no, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. The world needs them here. 
And in a way, they need the world because the, the trials the world gives us are preparing us. They shape us, they, they carve us, they mature us. In a sense, we need the pressures and tensions and trials of this world to improve ourselves, and the world desperately needs us. If God didn't want us in the world, he would have just raptured each of us individually once we got baptized, once we got saved. Now well, take them home. No, he's got the church in the world because there's a need for the church in the world. His kingdom is in the world. His kingdom is spreading in the world, and it's the church that's spreading it. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but while they're here, keep them from the evil one. Don't let them succumb to the wicked one's uh, efforts to destroy them. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Now, a lot of this is kind of deep and kind of strange language, but, and we could talk about it, but we can't. We don't have time. I do not ask for, uh, for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their words. So it's not just for them, but for us too. <coughs> he has these same concerns. That they may be one, all one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that I've, you've given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Now there's twice he says, so that the world will, in the first case, verse 21, believe that you sent me. And then in the next case, in verse 23, that the world will know that you sent me. How? That the church will be one, that Christians will be one, so that the world will know. Boy, no wonder the world doesn't know. Christians aren't very much one, are they? Now, <laughs> many people have pointed out the church should be unified, but how do we do that? The problem with the church that causes disunity is that we have wrongly defined the basis of fellowship. In the, in the time of Christ, in the early church in the book of Acts, and even for the early days of the persecuted church in the Roman Empire, the church was largely defined by those who followed Jesus and loved each other. Remember Jesus said, "This all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. It was a family thing. We had the same father. We're brothers and sisters. We're supposed to love as brethren. This is how we are known to be Christians. In other words, being a Christian had more to do with following Christ and obeying Christ and loving each other than it had to do with a, 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 a highly... Uh, developed system of beliefs. Now what happened was by the fourth century there were Christians who believed some things and Christians believed other things about some important topics, for example the Trinity. Uh, some believed in the Trinity, some didn't. And so they thought, well we should get all the bishops together and sort this out. So they got the bishops together, had a big ecumenical council as they called it, Council of Nicaea. And they sorted out some stuff. And they decided, okay, we have this specific doctrine about Jesus uh, now that everyone's supposed to believe to be a Christian. The people who held a different doctrine than this before the council, they're not Christians, they were their heretics. But then there were other issues that people disagreed, so they got, about, they got together with more councils and more councils and more councils. And what they did, they took what had been a dynamic family of people who were spiritually connected and loved each other as a, as a family and followed Jesus as a family, turned it into a group of people who agreed on, on a, a, a lot of fine-tuned doctrinal points. Every time there's another council, they fine-tuned it more. Another thing you had to agree about. And by the, every time the council was finished, they wrote a creed, and anyone who didn't believe the creed was not saved anymore. They had councils because Christians didn't agree. But suddenly, once the council said, this is the right view, those who didn't agree weren't Christians anymore. They're heretics now. So what happened? The devil managed to turn what had been a family of sacrifice and love for each other, because they all loved Christ and were following him in unity, into an organization that will sign every creed that has come along and says, I agree, I agree, I agree. Even though there are Christians who don't agree with some of those things, and who love the Lord, and who love each other. The things that Jesus said will define you as a Christian are no longer what we think of as defining people as Christians, but rather agreement on these points of doctrine. And this is how things evolve. So that the Roman Catholic Church, of course, comes up and it, you know, it persecutes everyone who doesn't agree with it for a thousand years. 
the, the Reformation happens, the Reformers persecute the people who don't believe in them, the Anabaptists, for example. Uh, and now there's thousands of denominations, and although they don't all persecute each other, they all feel it's pretty important to believe the right thing, and their denomination is the one that believes the right thing. Those who don't believe the same thing in different denominations, eh, not so sure about them. They might be saved, hard to say, because they don't have all the, the T's crossed and dots, I's dotted properly, because their theology might be wrong. This person believes in a pre trib rapture. This person doesn't. Uh-oh, what do we do now? Start two churches. Start a pre trib rapture church and a no pre trib rapture church. So we got a new denomination. Instead, what should the church do when there's disagreements? Paul wrote to the Roman church, and there were disagreements there among the Christians. In Romans 14, he said, some of you think you can eat anything you want. Some think you should only eat vegetables. Some keep one day special. Some think it's not necessary to keep one day special. Whoa, that's, that's the stuff of denominations. But Paul didn't say, okay, you people who believe only go start your own group, and these people start another group. No, he said, listen, just receive each other. Receive each other. Let everyone be fully convinced of his own mind. In other words, there are differences of opinion that we should tolerate. Instead, the church has more and more been defined by intolerance. Because a new denomination usually begins just this way. Someone's in one of the existing denominations. They begin to see the Bible somewhat differently. They begin to talk to people about it. They become a threat to the status quo of the denomination. They either leave angry or they are thrown out. Then what do they do? find the people who agree with them and start a new group. Got a new denomination, got thousands of them now. Now the problem here is that if you do this, you'll never be united. As long as you're defining your fellowship based on agreement on every point, you can't be united. Because no one, as long as human beings are thinking, they won't agree on everything. You know what my definition of a cult is? Two people who agree about everything. Because if two people agree about everything, someone's not thinking. Someone's letting the other one think for them. Because people just don't agree about everything. It's just not going to happen. And when you find a group that everyone's walking lockstep, it's cultic. In a family, it's not that way. You know that if you get together for, with family gatherings, and Thanksgiving or Christmas, or, they don't all have the same opinions about everything. Some of them are, have different political opinions or different religious views or different ideas about other things. Families don't have to agree about everything. Being a family is not based on agreeing. It's based on something else. It's based on basically mutual love and acceptance. And so was the church up until the whole thing got redefined by agreeing with the latest creed or being a heretic instead. Now, I'm, I believe that there are heresies that we should not endure, but most of the things Christians disagree about are not worth dis dividing about. What would have happened if the church, the, the Catholic Church had said to Martin Luther, okay, you disagree with us on these things. Well, we'll, we'll keep working on this. Let's keep talking. Let's keep fellowshipping together. Let's keep loving each other. And let's talk about this from time to time, see if we can sort it out. Maybe you can convince us. Maybe we can convince you. Maybe neither. Maybe we'll just have to be still one big family who has disagreements about this. Why not? Why do people have to divide? If you, if you suddenly, you see something different than the Christians you're with, you go off, take the people who agree with you, start another group. One thing you guarantee is no one's going to learn anything after that. Because everyone's now in an echo chamber. They all say the same thing. They don't fellowship with the people who have another view. But if the family all stays together, even though there's differences, and they receive each other in love, but they still discuss the differences, eventually iron sharpens iron, and they can come to agreements about things. Everyone can learn something. And... Jesus said he wants the church to be one. It doesn't have to be one in the same opinion about every subject, but one family, a family of love. That's how they'll know you're my disciples. That's how the world will know that Jesus uh, was sent from God. How to get there from here? I don't know how the institutional church can get there from here. Probably can't. But the real church is the body of Christ in and out of the institutional churches. It's made up of people, everyone who follows Jesus. And we as Christians have to live that unity with other Christians, even if the institutions don't, and then trust God to bring about the spread of that particular phenomenon so that the world will know. So anyway, uh, Jesus finishes up the prayer uh, in verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given to me may be with me where I'm going, to see my glory 
uh, that you have given to me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make known, uh, make it known that the, the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, frankly, the rest of John is narrative, story. Jesus, of course, is praying that prayer just before he goes to Gethsemane, where he gets arrested. The arrest of Jesus is recorded in all four Gospels. Um, <coughs> John has a few details that we don't have elsewhere, like uh, when the, they came to arrest him, he said, who are you seeking? And the soldiers said, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. And they all fell over backward. Just to show he's not at their mercy, I guess. Then they dusted themselves off, got on their feet, said, okay, they're probably a little perplexed. Hey, oh, I'm over here. Who are you seeking again? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I told you I'm him. But if I'm the one you're looking for, and you've just committed yourself to that verbally twice, then let these others go, because you're not looking for them. You've just said so. Right? So he said that to get his disciples off the hook. Otherwise, they would have all been rounded up and taken in. But he said, he made sure he got the soldiers to, to read the name on the warrant, <clears throat> rather than just to round up everyone that was in the garden with him there. You know, who are you here to arrest? Jesus of Nazareth. That's me. That's not these people. Let them go. That's what he said. And then they took him. And, of course, much of what I'm skipping over is found in the other Gospels, and I'm not going to be able to, to spend time with the duplicate material. Now, uh, we have Peter's three denials in John, just like we do in the other Gospels. We have Jesus facing Annas and Caiaphas. Now, this is not in the other Gospels. Caiaphas, yes. Annas, no. <clears throat> Annas and Caiaphas were both high priests. Now, that's not supposed to be. In the Jewish law, there was one high priest, and he was supposed to be the oldest male descendant of Aaron in any generation was the high priest. The other descendants of Aaron were priests. There was only one high priest. Annas was that high priest at one time, but he had been essentially removed and replaced with his son-in-law, Caiaphas, <coughs> pretty much by the Roman authorities. But the Jews didn't like the Romans, and so they tended to still respect Annas as the high priest, but Caiaphas was the legal high priest. So a lot of times, although Caiaphas as the high priest was the, the uh, president of the Sanhedrin, uh, Annas was not in, in an official office, but the Jews still honored Annas. And so we read in verse uh, chapter, in chapter 18, 12, the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus, bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that they, it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Now, we don't read of what happened at the house of Annas so much, but he apparently passed him on to uh, an ad hoc gathering of the Sanhedrin. Jesus, in the night that he was betrayed, had, before dawn, or until it ended shortly after dawn, he was on trial six times. Three times before Jewish tribunals and three times before Romans. Now, none of the Gospels records all of them. John supplements some of the ones that are left out of the other Gospels. But <clears throat> as it turns out, we find from John that the first trial Jesus had was at the house of Annas. We don't know any details of what happened there specifically. Then he was taken to a, a, a midnight gathering of the Sanhedrin supervised by Caiaphas. Now what they did is they tried to figure out something they could condemn Jesus for. They finally got him to say he was the son of God and, and therefore they condemned him for blasphemy. Then they apparently disbanded to discuss how they might uh, convince Pilate that this is something that Pilate should be concerned about. Pilate was the Roman. He didn't care about blasphemy, Jewish blasphemy. He was a blasphemer himself in all likelihood. But they couldn't kill him. They had to get the Romans to kill him. So they had a, a third gathering before dawn, a, a second one of the Sanhedrin. So it's the third time Jesus stands before Jews that night before dawn. And there they concoct a plan to accuse him of something that Pilate would be concerned about. Then after they've had the three hearings before Jews, they take him to Pilate, the Roman. Pilate doesn't want to deal with them. And so when Pilate finds out that Jesus was from 
Galilee. He said, well, Galilee, that's really Herod's jurisdiction. And Herod happens to be in town here in Jerusalem today because it's the Passover. So send him to Herod, another Roman official. So Jesus went to Herod. Luke tells us about that. Herod wanted Jesus to work a miracle and entertain him. And Jesus didn't accommodate him. Not only did he no, do no miracles, he wouldn't answer any questions. He wouldn't open his mouth. So Herod, becoming not amused, sent him back to Pilate. And so the third time, Jesus stood before a Roman tribunal with Pilate. And Pilate's the one who got stuck with him and had to condemn him. Didn't have to. Now, the interesting thing in all this is there, there are conversations between Jesus and Pilate in the Gospel of John that are not in the others. It's really quite fascinating, the picture of, of, of Pilate's personality. He clearly wanted to release Jesus. And multiple times in the course of the hearings, Pilate told Jesus, I've talked to him, he's innocent. I mean, this is like you've gone to court, the judge says, not guilty. Jesus should have walked. But the Jews were so adamant. There's a crowd of Jews at Pilate's gate screaming for Jesus death and Pilate didn't want to kill Jesus because he saw him as an innocent person but the Jews were bloodthirsty so Pilate actually had Jesus flogged mercilessly and hoped that that would placate the Jews they were calling for Jesus death Pilate thought killing Jesus is a little too extreme he doesn't deserve it so I'll beat him instead and maybe the Jews will look at him and say, okay, that's enough, we're, we're good, let him go. The Jews still were called out for his crucifixion. Now you can see Roman court justice wasn't quite just. Pilate had already declared, declared Jesus not guilty of the charges, but then he flogged him in, in an attempt to avoid killing him. But if he's not guilty, he shouldn't be flogged, he should be released. But Pilate was intimidated, and the reason was Judea was a very unmanageable province in the Roman Empire. Many governors before Pilate had come and gone as failures there because the Jews were volatile. Jews were fiercely independent, fiercely uh, rebellious against pagan authorities. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Grecians had all ruled the Jews. Now the Romans were, and they all found them fairly unmanageable because the Jews, they were willing to die for their principles in many cases, not all of them. And they would stand up to the authorities and say, I'm not doing what you say. And so many Roman governors had reacted severely with soldiers, you know, killing thousands of Jews in a, in, at a given time because of some rebellion of the Jews. And the place was just a, a powder keg. And no Roman wanted to be assigned to govern Judea. Pilate apparently was assigned there as a punishment for something, you know, by, by the emperor, because it's not a desirable post for a Roman. And of course, Pilate, knowing this, did not want this to become a huge explosion. These Jews were very angry. These Jews were very volatile. And so he's doing what he can to please them without doing something outrageously unjust, like killing an innocent man. However, he finally caves in, and he does so because <coughs> Although he's arguing with the Jews, and should I release your king? Why should I let him go? What has he done? Why should I let him go? What has he done? He's innocent. But they kept uh, calling for his death, and, and, they, and they finally said, this man said he's a king. Anyone who says he's a king is an enemy of Caesar. Now, there was a veiled and not so veiled threat in that statement. They're telling Pilate, this man is not a friend of Caesar. Now, whose side do you want to be on, Caesar's or this man? Now, any Roman official would want to be on Caesar's side, or at least per perceived as such, because you don't want to be on the bad side of the ruler of the world, who's a little upset when his subordinates are insubordinate. And so, it's kind of blackmail. The Jews are kind of blackmailing saying, you know, this guy said he's a king. You know, you know Caesar would not take kindly to someone saying he's a king in, in Caesar's province. You might consider that, Pilate. And Pilate did consider it and said, okay, I'm gonna let, you, let him be crucified. And he washed his hands of it to say, I don't believe this is the right thing to do and I wanna be innocent of it. However, washing his hands of doing the evil thing that he did is not, doesn't cleanse you. As an official, he should have done the right thing, even if he was you know, threatened. But he was an opportunist, like all Roman officials were, and uh, he didn't want to see—he didn't want to lose his job or his head, 
So he allowed the threats of the Jews, the implied threat that, that we'll tell Caesar if you don't get rid of this guy. Um, he let him go. Now, <coughs> we have Jesus crucified. Um, that story is very familiar to us from all three Gospels previous to this one. Jesus is buried, actually, by um, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, whom we've seen a couple times. Nicodemus was seen a couple times earlier in the book. Uh, they were Sanhedrin members who did not agree with the condemnation of Jesus, and they wanted to show their last respects to his body, so he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And um, <coughs> they did it rather rapidly because it was... Uh, the Sabbath was the next day. And Sabbath begins at sundown the previous day. I, I, you might know that. Jews today who observe Sabbath, or even Christians who do, some do, they recognize sundown Friday is the beginning of Saturday. So about 6 o'clock on every Friday, Sabbath observers, so they start observing the Sabbath through sundown Saturday. So Jesus was crucified apparently on Friday. Now there are different views about this. I won't get into them. But we, do, we are told the next day was the Sabbath. And they didn't want to leave the body hanging on the Sabbath. They wanted to hastily bury it. Jesus was on the cross until 3 o'clock. And that's only a few hours before Sabbath. So they didn't have time to do much to the body. They wrapped him and put him in a tomb. And apparently thought, after the Sabbath is over, we'll get back to this. We'll get back to this and give him a proper, you know, embalming or whatever. So the Sabbath passed, and the next day was the day after the Sabbath, which is Sunday. And it says this in verse chapter 20, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and she saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, harmonizing the events of Easter Sunday between the Gospels is a bit of a trick. It's not easy. However, I have reason to believe all the accounts are accurate. So that means you have to harmonize them some way. Other gospel accounts tell us that the first thing Sunday morning, it was not just Mary Magdalene. She was one of a group of women. Several women, including her, were going to the tomb with spices to embalm the body of Jesus. While they were on their way, the other gospel says, they were talking among themselves, how are we going to move that stone away? How are we going to get at the body anyway? They just figured, well, where there's a will, there's a way. We're going to go do it. But when they came, apparently in the distance, they saw the stone had been moved. So that wouldn't be an issue. But they didn't know what had happened. This story in John 20 tells us that Mary Magdalene assumed this meant that someone had stolen the body. So she left the other women and ran to the disciples to tell them. The other Gospels tell us that the other women went to the tomb and they saw angels there. This is not mentioned in John. The angels told the women that Jesus was raised and told uh, the women to go tell the disciples that Jesus would meet them in Galilee. So they ran off from the tomb. And by that time, according to John 20, Mary Magdalene had gotten to where the disciples were. She said, they've taken the body. We don't know where it is. Peter and John leap to their feet. They go running to the tomb. John's faster, more fleet of foot. He gets there first, but he doesn't go into the tomb. He stands outside, and Peter, more boisterous and more impetuous, just runs right on in. And John looks in, and they see no angel. The angel's not there at the moment, the angel who had spoken to the women. They see an empty tomb with the grave clothes of Jesus there, and they're scratching their heads. And it says at that point that John believed. Peter didn't know what to think. And so Peter and John left, apparently went back to the other disciples. That's in this gospel. The other gospels tell us that the women who, in the meantime, had been running to tell the disciples what the angels had told them, met Jesus on, on the way, and they grabbed his feet to worship him, and he said, listen, you know, I'm going away, go tell my disciples, like the angels told you, go tell them I'm going to meet him in Galilee. So the women go and do so, we read no more of them, except that they come to the disciples and, and report. But by now the disciples have already heard it, according to John from Mary Magdalene, and Peter and John have already investigated. And that's when, the, when Peter and John go away, Mary, re, you know, she's trailing behind him. She's been running back and forth. She's a little slower. John and Peter get to the tomb. They investigate. They leave. Mary's coming up behind, and she arrives, and she's alone. And there is an angel there. And the angel says, Mary, what are you looking for? And she kind of 
she kind of uh, doesn't really get engaged in a conversation there. Then she sees Jesus but doesn't recognize him. And he said, what are you looking for? And she said, uh, you know, if you've removed uh, the body of my Lord, uh, tell me, I'll go take it if it's in the way. She thought he was a gardener, a groundskeeper. And Jesus said, Mary, and she recognized him. And apparently she grabbed him like the other women had done. And he said, don't cling to me because I'm still going to ascend to my father. Now, he's no doubt referring to his ascension that would take place 40 days later. But don't cling to me, I think, was his way of saying, don't emotionally cling to me, as I can imagine she would. She loved him, and she lost him, and now he's back. So he's oh, you know, you're go not going anywhere now. I'm going to hang on to you, and oh, don't do that. I'm going away again. I'm not here to stay, in other words. I'm going to ascend to my father yet. But he said, go and tell the disciples that I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God, and I'll meet them and so forth. So she goes on her way, and uh, then Jesus appears that night to the disciples. It, it does mention them uh, being absent a couple. Of course, uh, Judas is gone. Uh, by this time, he's hanged himself. Uh, that's not recorded in John. It's recorded in Matthew. But uh, of course, we are told that Thomas was not with them on this occasion. So Judas and Thomas are not there. There's ten apostles there. And uh, uh, the apostles are meeting in the upper room, uh, probably just trying to decide, what do we do now? Because uh, they've heard that Jesus is risen. They've seen the grave clothes. They've seen the empty grave, but they haven't seen Jesus. They've heard reports from the women, but they, they're still skeptical. And Jesus appears in the room there in verses 19 through 23 and um, says, Peace be with you, as the Father sent me, so even so I'm sending you. And when he said this, verse 22, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, they are withheld. I cannot tell you exactly what that last line means. Different views exist. So the Roman Catholics believe that this means the apostles have the right to absolve sins, and no one else does, except for those that they have appointed. And the popes are the successors of the apostles, and they appoint the bishops and the priests, and so you have to confess your sins to a Catholic priest that they can absolve your sins, because they're agents of the apostles. I don't agree with any of that. But what does it mean? Most Protestants believe, you turn that heat down? <laughs> it's pretty hot, isn't it? Um, many Protestants believe that what he's simply saying is that the salvation of sinners is now depending on you. You are the ones who are going to spread the salvation message. If you do so, you'll be, in essence, forgiving people, and they will be forgiven. If you don't do so, you'll be, in essence, withholding forgiveness from them by not preaching the gospel to them, and therefore they won't be forgiven. So it could be simply saying, your, you know, the forgiveness of sinners depends on your carrying out your mission. If you do it, they'll be forgiven by being preached to by you. If you don't, well, then they won't. In any case, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Spirit. I believe they did on that occasion, though the Spirit didn't come upon them in power until 50 days later at Pentecost. But I believe the Spirit came to dwell in them. And I think there's a difference between having the Holy Spirit in you and having the Spirit upon you in power. Every Christian has the Spirit in them. If you're born again, the Holy Spirit has come to live within you. But not every Christian seems to have the power of the Spirit resting upon them. There is such thing as being filled with the Spirit, which Christians are exhorted to do. In Ephesians 5.18, Christians who have the Holy Spirit are told to be filled with the Spirit. So being filled with the Spirit isn't necessarily the same thing as just having the Holy Spirit. Just like for this bottle to be full of water is not the same thing as for having water in it. It could have this much water and still have water in it, but it wouldn't be full of water. And so also, there are Christians who, though they have the Holy Spirit, clearly are not filled with the Spirit. And that would even include these disciples on this occasion, because they had the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed the Spirit onto them. But they were filled with the Spirit, it says in Acts 2, 4, when the Spirit came upon them in power. It was after this, in fact, that he said, Tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. But wait for the promise of the Father. And, uh, of course, in Acts 1, 8, he says, You will be, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Spirit coming upon you is a phenomenon you have in the Old Testament a great deal. The Spirit came upon the prophets came upon the kings, came upon the judges, and gave them power. 
uh, empowered them. The Spirit of God coming upon you is different than the Holy Spirit living in you. That he lives in you means you are part of the body of Christ. Christ dwells in you. But that you're empowered requires having the Spirit come upon you. Now, some people have that happen when they're born again. Some don't. I didn't. I was born again for many years before I was baptized in the Spirit and had the Spirit come upon me. But, but that's uh, another issue not brought out in this passage. Now, uh, Thomas was not there when this happened, and he heard from the other apostles that Jesus had been there, but he was skeptical. This is why we call him Doubting Thomas. He said, you know, I won't believe until I put my finger in his hands, uh, in, in the holes in his hands, and my hand in the hole in his side. And then eight days later, Jesus appeared and said, hey, Thomas, put your finger in the holes of my hands and your hand in the hole of my side. Notice he repeated back Thomas's own words to him, though Jesus was not visibly present when Thomas said them. And uh, this is an interesting thing about Jesus after he rose from the dead. He'd kind of appear and disappear. He was in a physical body, but it was a glorified body. It had apparently supernatural characteristics. By the way, the Bible says when we're resurrected, our bodies will be like his resurrected body. But So they'll have these characteristics too, apparently. But uh, Jesus in his glorified body, appeared and disappeared many times. Over a period of 40 days, he kind of was there, sometimes not there, sometimes visibly. But he was always there, invisibly. And that's what he points out to them. See, they've been used to having him visibly with them for three and a half years before this. He's going to be gone for good, or at least for the rest of their lifetime, shortly after his ascension. They're not going to see him anymore. So in that interim of 40 days, he kind of conditions them to recognize that you're not going to be seeing me like you have in the past, but I'm still here. For example, Thomas, I heard what you said when you said you won't believe until you touch my holes and my hands and slide. Well, you didn't see me, but I was here. And, it, you know, go ahead and try this. It's essentially what Jesus seems to be doing in the days after his resurrection. is getting the disciples used to the idea that although they can't see him like they always have before, he's as much there as ever. Remember in the end of Matthew, he said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Not in the same sense, not visibly. Now, chapter 21 is that story, and I alluded to it before. I, I'm not going to it in detail now, but that, uh, there's another time that Jesus appeared to the disciples uh, at the Sea of Galilee this time, the other end of the country. And there were some of them, I think seven of them are named, if I'm not mistaken, who are out fishing, um, and they don't catch anything. And they, there's some man unidentified to them on the shore says, try the other side of the boat. And so they do, and they find there's a lot of fish in their net after that. And so John says to Peter, that's Jesus. That's the Lord. They didn't know it until they saw him do something that they'd seen him do before. Because he had done that at the same time he called them to be the, the four fishermen he called from Galilee originally. It was after he gave them a great catch of fish. Now he done it, does it again, kind of recognized in his characteristic actions John says, that's the Lord. Peter, the impetuous one, jumps into the water. Let's the other guys pull the fish into the boat. Mm -hmm. He swims ashore. Now they come lagging behind, with towing a big net full of fish. And they finally get to shore too. So they're all ashore with Jesus, and Jesus already has fish. They're on the fire. And, and he offers them food, and he has a conversation with them. It's very strange. One of the things it says about, about him there. It says, none of them dared to ask him who he was because they knew it was the Lord. What a weird thing to say. They didn't dare ask him who he was because they knew he was the Lord. It almost makes it seem like they kind of wanted to ask him, but they didn't dare. But why would they want to ask him if they knew him? It's one of those many things. When Jesus came back from the grave, it was him, but he was different. Mary Magdalene, one of his best friends, didn't recognize him initially until he spoke her name. Two men on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, they didn't recognize him until he sat down and, bread and broke bread. Then they recognized him and they vanished. He didn't look the same in some ways. Even his disciples, they know that's him. I mean, he's got the holes and everything. It's clearly him. He did the same thing, this catch of fishes like he did earlier. We know it's the Lord, but I kind of want to ask him, who are you? You know? So it, it's mysterious. It's almost like 
he must have looked a little different. And that, that's him. But I'd really like to get confirmation on that, you know. But I don't dare ask. Very strange. But that very line indicates John's recollection of Jesus resurrected. How, you know, how, how strange it was to the disciples during that time. And that even that he seemed, even looked a bit strange to them. Apparently, the only thing that gave it away that he was certainly the Lord was the holes in the hands. And, you know, the fact that he could appear and disappear and give them a great catch of fish and things like that. Yeah, clearly, it was stuff that is supernatural. But his appearance was apparently different. And maybe ours will be too in the resurrection. For some of us, that'll be good news. Uh, <laughs> others, maybe not so much. But it won't be anything bad, I'm sure. It didn't say he was ugly or anything like that. It just looked different. <laughs> Well, the story ends, of course, with this conversation between Jesus and Peter. And Jesus is telling, he, he first says, Peter, do you love me more than these? A bit of a jab at Peter in a way, because Peter at the up, in the upper room had said, even if all these others deny you, I would never do so. As if to say, you know, these guys don't know if they love you. I do. I love you more than they do. They might betray you. I, I wouldn't trust them. But I, I won't betray you. And then he's the one who goes out and betrays Jesus, you know, de denies him uh, three times. And so this is the first time Jesus had a heart-to-heart uh, -heart with Peter. He says, do you love me more than these? Ooh, you know, how could he say yes? And Jesus actually said, do you agape me, which is a, a, you know, a very selfless kind of love. And Peter said, I phileo you, which is also love, but it's more like a f love between friends. Jesus said, do you agape me? He said, I, I, I phileo you. And Jesus said again, do you agape me? And Peter said, I, I phileo you. The third time, Jesus said, do you phileo me? And Peter said, you know all things, you know that I phileo you. And as Jesus accommodated him, Jesus was setting the bar higher than Peter was able to confess. Why wouldn't he say, I agape you? Because Jesus said, greater agape has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And Peter wouldn't do that. Peter denied him rather than lay down his life for him. So Peter is no doubt ashamed to say, I got for you. So Jesus said, I'll soften it a little bit. Do you even phileo me? Peter said, yes, that I can say. <laughs> you know, I do. I have a friend, uh, love of friendship with you. But it, it's so sad. But, but in, both, in all three cases, Jesus said, feed my sheep or tend my sheep or feed my lambs. Every time Peter said, I love you, he said, tend my sheep or feed my sheep. And basically he's saying, I'm reinstalling you. As a shepherd of, of people, you've kind of disqualified yourself when you denied me three times, but you've just confessed me three times. I'm going to count that as requalifying to be one of my preachers. You can feed my sheep now with the rest of them. And then he talks to Peter about the fact that Peter's going to die. It's rather cryptic, but it's what he's talking about. John says he was speaking about how Peter in death would glorify the Lord. And Peter sees John, he says, what about him? And Jesus says, well, if it's my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And, and the book closes by John saying, that statement led to apparently a widespread rumor that John would not die before Jesus came back. And at the very end of the book, John says, but that's not what Jesus said. And he clarifies what he said and what he didn't say. So apparently that last chapter, and I mentioned this in our first session, that last chapter may have been added because after the rest of the book was written, it became, John became aware that there were people wrongfully saying that John wouldn't die. And it was based on a misunderstanding of the statement. So he tells this story, he adds it to the book of John, which otherwise at the end of chapter 20 looks like it's closing. But chapter 21 is like an appendix added on, and it was apparently added on to dispel this false rumor that Peter, that, that Peter had been told by Jesus that John wouldn't die. Well, that's all the time we have for John. In fact, that's more than the time we had for John. And so we're going to have to take 1st, 2nd John, 3rd John tomorrow and, and very possibly get some revelation in there tomorrow. And then we have Revelation on Friday. And then we're done with all your coverage of the whole Bible for this year. Uh, isn't that great? Yeah, for this year. Yeah, next year's in a few weeks. You're going to have to go through the Bible. Again. All right? Good.